Let's turn our attention now to God's Word as we open our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and once again I will read, beginning in verse number 1 down to verse number 7 with our focus being on verses number 5 and 6. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And here's our focus. Through Him, that is through this Jesus, this Son of God, this Son of David, this resurrected Lord, through Him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for His name's sake among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the inspired, infallible, authoritative, and all-sufficient word of the living God. May he write its truths on our hearts this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, merciful and gracious, forgiving transgression and sin and iniquity. But you are also a God of justice. And you are just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus because you have been pleased to send a Savior. Help us to understand, though, this morning, the implications of our participation in the gospel. May we not settle for consumer Christianity. May you convict us of our neglect of the gospel mission. And may today be the day where your people are stirred up once again to go from this place and proclaim this good news concerning your Son. Only you can do this, Lord, so we beg We beg you to come by your Spirit and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. In the year 1839, two missionaries by the names of John Williams and James Harris landed on an island among other islands in the South Pacific Pacific, known as the New Hebrides. They had gone there to proclaim the name of Christ among the people who had never heard that name before. As soon as they arrived on the shore, they and their company were clubbed to death and eaten by the cannibal peoples of the island. In the mid-1850s, not even 20 years later, the London Missionary Society had another missionary who volunteered to go to the same islands and proclaimed the same gospel. His name was John G. Payton. His professors and his teachers at that time implored him not to go. His congregation begged and pleaded with him not to go. They offered him more money. They offered him a bigger house. If only he would stay and continue his ministry there at home. Some told him, there are unbelievers here that you can reach. Others told him, Based on your giftedness and the affirmation of your church, this is where God would have you to be. Stay here. One older saint seemed to speak what everyone else was thinking when he told Peyton, the cannibals, you will be eaten by cannibals. And this is how John G. Peyton replied. Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now. And your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, 
It will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. John G. Payton goes on later in life to write in his own biography about this time in his life. He said, It resounded in my ears, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And lo, I am with you always. These words kept ringing in my ears. These were our marching orders. Peyton did go to the New Hebrides. And although he was not killed and eaten by cannibals, his labors there were difficult and sorrowful. He spent much of his time running and hiding from the cannibals. Much of his work was undone by attack. His wife and his newborn son died only four months after arrival, which was followed by him spending weeks not leaving their grave, trying to keep the cannibals from digging them up and eating their bodies. And in spite of all this suffering, Peyton spent the rest of his life proclaiming the gospel to these people. And he's seen many, in fact, one whole island come to Christ. What is it that makes such a man? This isn't unique to John G. Payton. There are the Adoniram Judsons of the world. There are the Hudson Taylors of the faith. There are the David Brainerds, the Jim Elliots, the Nate Saints, the Amy Carmichaels. What is it that takes healthy, well-established, well well sought out people with promising talents, with a successful life ahead of them, what makes them give it all away to take the name of Christ to those who have never heard? I submit to you this morning, it's one simple realization. Namely, that when God saves a sinner in Christ, He saves them for a purpose beyond their own experience of grace. He saves them out of the world to then send them back into the world and proclaim the same gospel by which He saved them. That's what Paul is saying here in verses 5 and 6 of Romans chapter 1. We've seen Paul's gospel testimony. We've seen the gospel that he believed. And now Paul sets before us the reality of the gospel mission with which he was engaged. In this passage, Paul is showing us that when God saves you by His grace, He also calls you to His mission. In other words, we are not only called to participate in the gospel of grace, we are commanded to proclaim the gospel of grace. God has given you grace in His Son not to just consume it, But He's also called you to take it into the world and advance this gospel in the hearts of His people for the sake of His Son. And I want us to focus on that this morning because as we will see, it's not just true for the John Paytons and for the Apostle Pauls. It's true for every believer in Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want us to notice here is the foundation of of the gospel mission. The foundation of the gospel mission. We see in verse number 5, Paul says, Through Christ we have received grace. Now remember, Paul has just said that this Christ, this Jesus, the Son of God, is the substance of the gospel. The entire message of the gospel, the goodness of the gospel, and the news of the gospel centers on this person. It's the good news about who Jesus is, and it's the good news about what Jesus has done. And now, he's drawing out the practical implications of this gospel. The gospel of God concerning His Son, through whom we have received grace. The first thing that he says about this gospel is that it gives grace to sinners. Mm -hmm. 
Through Jesus, through the Son of God who took on flesh, through this one who became a man, who lived a life of perfect obedience in our place, who died on a cross taking our wrath, who took the cup of hell that we deserve and drank it down completely, who suffered in his own body on the tree that he might bring us to God, who tasted death in our stead, who rose from the grave to win our redemption, who goes in before God and presents his own blood as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Through that Christ, we now get grace. We have received grace. Paul speaks of grace more than anyone else in the Scriptures. Paul speaks of grace more in the book of Romans than he does anywhere else in his letters. Why? Because Romans focuses on one thing. The gospel, the accomplishments of the gospel, the application of the gospel. And all of that has as its heart grace. So to understand what Paul is saying here, we need to understand grace. What is grace? Grace is the sovereign, saving favor of God, exercised... In giving every spiritual blessing in Christ to those who only deserve wrath. Grace is the sovereign, that is the free and the authoritative saving favor of God. That he exercises in giving every spiritual blessing in Christ to those who only deserve wrath. Paul knew this grace for himself. He had experienced this grace personally. Remember, as we heard his gospel testimony, he he said about himself in 1 Timothy, Although I was formerly a persecutor and a blasphemer, I obtained mercy. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Because this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Grace abundant, saving favor to the overflow. God freely giving me not just what I don't deserve, but the exact opposite of what I do deserve. So Paul could say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he doesn't just say this for himself. He says this for every believer. He tells the church in Ephesus, for by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Literally, the word grace means gifting. So he's saying it is a gifting of gifting of God that you are saved. This salvation, this life, this forgiveness, this freedom from sin, freedom from death, deliverance from eternal hell, all are gifts of God freely given to those who deserve wrath and hell and death. But what Paul wants us to understand here is that this grace doesn't end merely with our receiving it and our enjoying it. Paul says, I received grace and apostleship. A gift and a charge. I received salvation and I received a mission. At the moment he was captivated by God's saving grace, he was also commissioned to participate in the gospel mission. Saved by the gospel, sent out to preach the gospel. These realities were inseparable in the mind of Paul. As soon as he is converted, we read this in Acts chapter 9. Immediately, he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. All who heard it were amazed and said, It's not this he who destroyed those who called on this name. But Saul increased all the more in strength, confounding the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Remember what he told the Corinthians. He said, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? 
He says, God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors, representatives of Christ. As though God is pleading through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Gifted with grace, entrusted with a message, appointed as a representative, and then sent out to proclaim and represent. That is the reality of the gospel of grace. Now as you hear that, you may be thinking, well, Paul was an apostle, or what we like to say in Sunday school, a big A apostle. We are not apostles. That is true. Paul had been called to be an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. He had been specially chosen, separated to receive God's scripture. He had been given the authority to govern over the churches. However, the nature of this apostleship that he's talking about here is simply this. Proclaiming the gospel of God's grace. And that responsibility is given to every Christian. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter 2... You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. And then there's not a period. It goes on. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So yes, there is this reality of grace. You've been called out of darkness into light. But here's this reality of mission. You've been called out of darkness into light so that you can go back into the darkness and proclaim the glory of the one who called you. So grace is not only the fountain of salvation, it is the foundation of the gospel mission. You have received grace and salvation Not to be a consumer. You have received grace and salvation not to be a consumer. Is that the way you think? Or do you sit here this morning with a consumer mentality? If I ask you to write down on a piece of paper what the gospel has done in your life, I wonder what you would write. Perhaps you would say, I have a sense of forgiveness. I have peace with God. I've been given eternal life. I've experienced freedom from my guilt and from my shame and from my past. I enjoy fellowship with God as I read His Word. As I gather with the saints, I feel His Spirit. Would your call to participate in Christ's gospel mission be on the bottom of the list? Would it even be on the list at all? This is the reality of the gospel. You were saved to be sent. You were called out to be commissioned. You were given grace to go out and proclaim His gospel, not to sit on a pew and consume. Think about Christ's words to the disciples gathered on the mount after He's been resurrected. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you guys kick back and watch me take over the world. It's not what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth is mine. Now you go and make disciples. Think about the contrast to the lost, to those who are in darkness. The resurrected Christ says, come, come to me and have life. And for those who do come and experience this grace, he says, now go, go back and proclaim this gospel. So the foundation of the gospel mission is the very salvation we've come to know and to enjoy. But it is not a grace to sit. It's a grace to go. That was true for Paul and it's true for us. But we see secondly, not just the foundation of the gospel mission, but also the objective or the goal of the gospel mission. He says in verse 5, Through Christ... We have received grace and apostleship for or to bring about 
the obedience to the faith. Paul understood his mission that he had received from the Lord in his salvation to be bringing about the obedience of the faith. Now, when you hear that, if you've been listening at all ever to me preach anything, it ought to strike you as a bit odd because no one, not even the Apostle Paul, can bring about faith in someone's heart. We can make people do things. We can coerce and manipulate people into making a temporary decision. As much as you love your money and your stuff, I could threaten your life or your family's life and cause you to let go of the stuff you don't want to let go of. We can manipulate and cause people to do things. But we cannot cause people to truly, wholeheartedly believe the gospel. Only God can do that. Jesus said, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So how can the objective of the mission, the very goal of the gospel be to bring about the obedience of faith? How can Paul engage in this impossible mission? How can Christ commission us to this impossible mission? Well, we find the answer here in the letter of Romans. In Romans chapter 10, Paul says this, Faith comes by hearing. Yes, amen. And hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So the Word of God, specifically in the context of the book of Romans, is the Gospel of God. This good news concerning God's Son is to be proclaimed so that people can hear it. And as people hear it, obedience of the faith is produced in the heart of those who are hearing it. God Himself produces it through the preaching of the gospel. We see this in Scripture on the day of Pentecost, what some people call the first ever sermon in the New Testament church. The Holy Spirit comes down. The disciples are filled with the Spirit and begins preaching the gospel in languages not their own. In such a way, the crowd see it at first and say, look at these, this is a bunch of drunks. It's early in the morning and they're already drunk, acting like crazy people. But then... Peter begins preaching the gospel, the good news about who Jesus is and what he has done. And this is what we read. When the crowds heard this, Acts 2.37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? We go on to read 3,000 people come to faith in Christ and are added to the church that day. Later on, the ministry of Paul himself, Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching in the synagogue. And as he is preaching, the crowds come, the people are captivated by what he's saying. So the Jewish religious leaders become jealous and begin contradicting what he is saying. It, 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 a riot ensues. The people are wanting to cast Paul and Barnabas out of the synagogue. So Paul says, fine, we will go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The and as he's preaching to the Gentiles, we read this in Acts 13, 48. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many has been, had been appointed to eternal life, believed. The preaching of the gospel drew out from the crowd those who were appointed to eternal life and the preaching was the means by which they were brought to believe. Yes, amen. Again, just for one more illustration, Acts 16, Paul is preaching in Philippi. And he and his companion go out to the riverside where they suppose there would be people gathering to worship God. And there beside the river, there is a woman of some affluence. Her name is Lydia. She's listening. In Acts 16, 14, we read this. The Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to the things spoken by Paul. Paul is preaching. God is working. And through the preaching, God opens this woman's heart to believe the gospel. You go on reading. She believes the gospel. Her whole house believes the gospel. The gospel is how we look at the objective of the mission with confidence. This is why Paul can say right here in Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It 
The gospel, this message, this good news, it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. You say they, they believed. Why did they believe? Because God in His power gave them the obedience of faith through the preaching of this good news. The gospel message with which Paul had been entrusted is the tool in God's hand that he uses to save sinners. And you think about how that, that the only explanation for this saving sinners could be God's own work. Think of what the gospel does. The gospel comes and confronts man in his sin and his rebellion. It's this gospel that tells man there is a God and this God is good. It's this gospel that sets before man the reality that this God, who is good, is perfectly just. He's absolutely righteous. And because of that, He hates sin. And He must see that sin is met with perfect justice. It's this gospel that exposes man. And it says to man, all of your righteousness, the very best you can bring to God is like a filthy rag. It's this gospel that tells man on his own, the only thing he will ever deserve from God is everlasting punishment and contempt. But then the gospel comes and sets before the hearts of men the good news that God in His grace has made a way. He's come down in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has lived the life we, we need to live. Jesus Christ has given to God the worship we ought to give. Jesus Christ has fulfilled God's requirement in every way. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ died for sinners, not for His own sin. He had none. He, he died for your sin. And He rose again for this very reason that I could come to you right now and tell you that if you will turn from your sins and look to Him, you can have life. Yes. Amen. Everything about that message is contrary to man in his natural self. Everything about it. The gospel of man is, I can do better. If I just had this, I'd be a little better. The gospel of God is... There is no hope for you apart from Christ. And it is this gospel, the preaching, what I just did in those few short statements, the preaching of that message God uses to save sinners. Or to use Paul's language, He uses the gospel to bring about the obedience of faith. Because God uses means. Now this means for us, That in order to accomplish the gospel mission with which we've been entrusted, you must proclaim the gospel. The gospel is news. It must be spoken. There is no such thing as living out the gospel. There's no such thing as living out the gospel. You cannot live out the good news of salvation accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the New Testament do we see Christ or the apostles or the Spirit speaking through the apostles saying, go live out the gospel. You cannot live out the holiness of God. You cannot live out His wrath against sin. You cannot live out God's demand for faith and repentance. Now you ought to live a life consistent with this gospel, meaning you ought to live like Christ is Lord and God. But in order to bring about faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. This is why you must know the Gospel. Because you've been called to proclaim it. In that section of Romans 10 where Paul says faith comes by hearing, he also says this, How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's that reality that takes the John G. Paytons to the New Hebrides. It's that reality that causes, uh, 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 causes people 
to, to set aside their success, to set aside their accomplishments, to set aside their potential and go to the nations. It's that reality that causes David Brainerd with tuberculosis to cough up his blood and his lungs in the snow so that the Native Americans could hear the gospel. It's this reality that takes a Jim Elliot who could have had any pulpit in America he wanted and say, let's go to those Alka people who have killed everyone else who's tried to come to them. This reality, how can they hear without a preacher? But here's the reality for you this morning. How shall they preach if they don't even know what the gospel is? The objective, bringing about the obedience of the faith, is accomplished by proclaiming the good news concerning God's Son. So you must not only proclaim it, but on the more fundamental level, you must know it in order to proclaim it. Thirdly, we see not just the foundation of the gospel mission and the objective of the gospel mission. Thirdly, we see the scope of the gospel mission. He says in verse 5, Through Christ we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith among all the nations. This message of the good news of what God has done to save sinners is for every people. For every people. Now think about how shocking that was to the first century Jew. That their entire history was God telling them to come out and be different from every other person. I've chosen you out of all the world. You are my own special people. And now he says, in all of that time, I was making the way for the Christ to come so that I could bring in all the peoples. You think again of how shocking it would be that this man, the Apostle Paul, who would have been the perfect missionary to the Jews, is sent not to the Jews, but to the peoples of all nations. It's scandalous. It's unthinkable. But this is the mission of the gospel. To bring into one all of God's people who are scattered among the nations. This has always been God's plan. As we talked about last week, it's not new. It's not shocking to us who sit here. None of us of the pure bloodlines of ethnic Israel. Of course, we've been brought here from all the nations. It's not shocking to us. So the emphasis I want us to focus on here is not the fact that the gospel is for all the nations. What has been forgotten in our day is that our own nation is part of the nations. The scope of the gospel mission is all the nations. But look at what Paul says in verse 6. The gospel is going out to all the nations, but among whom you also are the called of Christ. Among whom who? You Romans. We've bought the lie that missions, that the gospel needs to be proclaimed in, in the sense of missions only in India. Yeah, there are tribesmen in the Amazon bush. There are the unreached, like those to whom John G. Payton went so long ago. But we must not forget, Union Grove, North Carolina is part of the nations. Taylorsville, Statesville, Wilkesboro, Moxville, Salisbury, Olin, Mooresville, Charlotte, Gastonia, Hickory, all of these places, that's part of the nations. This is the mistake in the thinking of so many. They think the gospel needs to be proclaimed to all the nations. Yeah, well, there's unreached people groups. Let's get the gospel to them so that we can put some money in the plate and then go home and watch TV. Because there's no gospel work to do here. This is America. Everybody's a Christian. The gospel must also be proclaimed here because we are part of the nations. Perhaps God has not called you to the jungles of Indonesia, but He has placed you in your family as a believer to proclaim the excellencies of the one who saved you. He has put you in a specific neighborhood as a believer to proclaim this good news concerning God's Son. He has put you on your job as a believer to proclaim the good news that there is salvation and life in Christ. We live in one of the most gospel-starved places on earth. 
Not because people have no access to the gospel, but because people are saturated with false gospels. Look at our country right now. Fear reigns. People have bought the lie, the gospel of vaccination. If we could just get this vaccine, everything would be good. Good news. Cities are on fire. Churches are closed. And the only hope being offered by mainstream, quote unquote, Christianity is this. We promise with all of our hearts that we're not racist. We see you. We love justice. We stand in solidarity with you. We love our neighbors. God cares about justice. Now that may get likes on Facebook. And that may give you all the warms and fuzzies. But that will not bring about the obedience of faith. Only the gospel can do that. What will it profit a man to be safe from a physical virus and then lose his own soul? What will it profit a man to feel equal and then lose his own soul? What will it profit a man to live through a pandemic and a social crisis and then spend eternity in hell? Now that doesn't mean we don't do good. It doesn't mean we ought not seek out health. It doesn't mean we don't serve in practical ways. It doesn't mean we don't stand for justice. It doesn't mean that we ought not love our neighbors. It doesn't mean that we should not seek their good. It means that the primary mission of Christ in the world is to spread His kingdom in the hearts of sinners by the preaching of His gospel. Look where God has placed you. Realize the message He's entrusted to you. Take up the mission to which He has called you and live like you belong to a different kingdom than this one. Proclaim Christ where you are. Yes, we ought to be a people laboring to get the gospel to the nations, but that doesn't mean take up a collection and our work is done. It means laying down your life as a living sacrifice to see Christ proclaimed among all the nations, especially the nation that you live in. Lift high the name of Christ. Rescue the perishing. Proclaim the good news to the lost around you. This is our marching order. We see, finally, the passion of the gospel mission. He says in verse 5, Through Christ we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name's sake. What is it that drove Paul to press on in his mission? What is it that caused him to set aside his prestige, to set aside his accomplishments, to set aside the path of success that he was on? What is it that caused him to set all of those things aside? The surpassing worth of knowing Christ. What kept him going through suffering, through mockery, through persecution, through rejection? What caused him to lay down his life and die? The glory of the one who had saved him. He did it all for the glory of Christ. This is what it means to live for his name. It was Paul's passion. It was his obsession. It was his chief aim in life to see that the glory of Christ was proclaimed and made known. It was his passion to see that in the proclamation and in the making known of Christ, sinners came to believe and to love this Christ. So that this Christ would be worshipped as He ought to be. So that this Christ would be treasured as He ought to be by everyone. Now He had a burden for the loss. In fact, in Romans 9, He says, I wish that I could be cut off from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, my people. He had a burden. But that burden was not what sustained His life as a living sacrifice. Because his countrymen turned against him. Everywhere he went, his countrymen, according to the flesh, tried to kill him. A man living for his countrymen can only tolerate that for so long. Something more. It was the glory of Christ that drove him. That was his supreme passion. And it was his supreme passion because that is God's supreme passion. He had been called to participate In the mission of God Himself. Remember what God told Abraham. Through your seed. All the nations will be blessed. 
I'm taking this seed and the good news about who He is and what He has done, and I'm sending it to all the nations. God told Moses in Numbers 14, 21, As truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with my glory. God told the prophet Habakkuk, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of my glory as the waters cover the sea. God told the prophet Isaiah, It's too small a thing that I should send my Messiah just to Israel and the tribes of Judah. I will make him as a light for all the nations that the whole world can come to know my salvation. God told the prophet Malachi, From the rising of the sun to the going down, my name will be great among the the Gentiles. My name will be great among the nations. So Paul says here in Romans chapter 15, it is my aim to preach Christ where he has not yet been named. And you see that as he tells them, he says from Jerusalem to Illyricum, all of this area here in the middle, there's no more room there. I've proclaimed Christ everywhere. But I hope to see you on my way to Spain. What are you going to Spain for? Because Christ has not yet been proclaimed there. And my desire is that He would be proclaimed everywhere. That He would be known everywhere. That He would be treasured everywhere. And when you love Christ, who doesn't change, you can face the disapproval of men. Paul told the Galatians, am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. His passion was like the soldier charging the enemy line so that the banner of his king could be seen on the battlefield of the world, advancing, breaking through the line, conquering, so that others would see the standard advancing and would join in and would push and would conquer so that Christ would have the prize for which he died. Psalm 2. We see the Father saying to the resurrected, exalted Son, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth, your possession. This is why Jesus said, All authority is mine. In heaven and on earth. Now go to the nations and make disciples. How does Christ advance His kingdom? By conquering hearts of individual people among all the nations. How do we join in that mission? By longing to see Christ have His kingdom. By proclaiming His gospel. And seeing the nations gathered in. And what I want us to understand this morning, to come full circle with where we started, Paul's passion for Christ flowed from his understanding of what God had done for him in Christ. Through Christ, I have received grace and apostleship, he says, for his name. I've received from Christ grace. Now I'm working for Christ for His name's sake. I've received grace. Now I'm proclaiming His grace for His glory. Listen to this language. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You feel the personal aspect of that? Christ loved me. Christ gave Himself for me. So I have died that I might live for Him. Again, 2 Corinthians 5. He says, the love of Christ constrains or compels me. Because this is my conclusion. One died for all. So all have died. And He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for Him who died for them. Here's the reality. God in His grace has offered up a Savior to die. And I am alive because that Savior died. So now my obligation is to live for the one who died for me. Acts chapter 20. When the prophets tell Paul, you're going to Jerusalem and you're going to be bound and you're going to die. He says, I do not account my life as valuable or as precious to myself at all. If only I can finish the race and complete the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Yes. Paul, don't you understand what's going to happen if you go and preach there? Yeah, the only thing I care about is to preach the gospel of Christ. But they'll kill you. Let them kill me. My life means nothing. To live is Christ, to die is gain. 
but they'll cast you out. I have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You won't be welcome there, Paul. He will receive me into his heavenly kingdom. What do I have to lose? As Jim Elliot said, and as the Puritan said, almost three centuries before Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Why did Paul live this way? Because he realized when God saves a sinner, He saves them for a purpose beyond just their receiving grace. He saves them out of the world to send them back into the world. He gives them grace so that they would proclaim grace. He provides life and salvation so that they will participate in the gospel mission to testify to the grace of God. It's not a hard concept to get. It's not new. You've heard these things before. But the reality is, many hear these truths over and over and over again and content themselves with riding these church pews until they die and see Jesus. If you are a believer, you have been given a commission. If you are a believer, you have been enlisted into this kingdom's conflict. If you are a believer, you have a real enemy, a raging and roaring lion seeking to devour, blaspheming the name of your king, the one who died for you, and you've been called out and given every spiritual blessing because your king died for you. And now he says, go. Go and proclaim. Go and tell them what I've done for you. You've been called to participate in this gospel mission to spread the aroma of Christ everywhere. You think of that picture. You know what aroma? Aroma is a smell. We were, I was at mom's house yesterday replacing some deck boards on the back porch. And there was a dead frog on the porch. Whenever you smell something that's dead, nobody says, ah, yeah, that's good. But everybody says, oh, what is that smell? Perhaps as you've been listening this morning, you've heard the echoes of the hound dog locked up in his kennel across the way here. When he wanders across the road into the cow pasture and rolls in all of the little prizes the cows have left, and then he comes home, you don't even have to see him. You open the door and the aroma hits you. And everywhere he goes around the yard, he spreads that aroma. You don't have to wonder what it is. This is imagery Paul is using here. We have been called to spread the aroma of Christ. Everywhere you go, people should be following you and hearing Christ. People should be hearing this gospel everywhere you go. At home, at work, in the store, in the car, in the fellowship, at the prayer time. Everywhere you go, aroma of Christ. Christ, Christ, Christ in Him crucified. Christ in Him crucified. This is the mission you've been called to. Amen. You've been called to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I was formerly a persecutor and a blasphemer, but mercy and grace and love was given to me in Christ for this reason, so that I could come here and tell you I'm the chief of sinners. We go, we go to Charlotte tonight. We're not going up there saying, hey, listen, all of you get your act together and act like us. We're going to saying, listen, this is just a small thing that you're doing. We're the chief of sinners. The worst, the worst of the worst. But God's grace has abounded toward me. And in Christ, it can abound toward you. Come, come and know this Christ. So the question for you this morning is are you engaged in this mission? Or are you content with being a consumer? As we continue in our study of the book of Romans, focusing on the gospel of God, It is not just for your information. It's so that you might be equipped for the work of ministry to proclaim this gospel. God has given you grace in His Son for the advancement of the gospel in the world for the sake of Christ. The reality is this. If you are not proclaiming the gospel, then Christ is not your greatest passion. And if Christ is your greatest passion, you will be proclaiming the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you.
for the Great Commission that Christ has conquered, that all authority in heaven and on earth is His. We thank You that You have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of Your beloved Son in whom we have redemption by His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Thank You that You've called us out of darkness into Your marvelous light. And may You stir up within us a passion to go back into the darkness and proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord. Not just sending money to missionaries overseas, but going to our own homes, to our own neighborhoods, to our own workplaces, and proclaiming the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, for your glory alone. Help us to do this, we pray. Convict us of our failure. May we not hear these as words for someone else, but may we hear them for ourselves. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.